Well, we're in the season of epiphany, and uh, the definition in, for epiphany in the, in the um, dictionary has a couple of definitions. One, a revelatory manifestation of a divine being. <clears throat> and the other, it is a sudden insight or intuitive understanding. It's an aha moment. And, uh, and I think we can see all kinds of times when we have revelations of God's presence and when we have aha moments, not necessarily spiritual. But um, recently I was playing golf, and while I was playing golf, oh, I got the clicker. What am I doing looking at you? Um, this is epiphany. Um, I was coming off the first green at Whispering Pines, and I love playing golf first thing in the morning, first one out. Oftentimes I see sunrises, and they're wonderful, but uh, but this one um, took my breath away. One of the other parishioners here that I was playing golf with pointed it out to me, and I, I turned, and it was like um, the hand of God pulling up the sun with those fingers of clouds. And, and in this picture, the, the light is so different that you don't... Uh, what I saw that day was it was as if there were white clouds reaching this way and dark clouds reaching this way. And it seemed like the night and the day were shaking hands. It was, uh, it was really kind of an inspiring um, and spiritual kind of a look to the sky that day. It was amazing. So I took this picture with my cheap camera uh, for in my phone, <clears throat> and it doesn't do justice to the image, um, but I, d I loved it anyway. And, uh, and I think that oftentimes we have epiphanies. We, you know, I can remember, you know, certainly sitting on the edge of the Grand Canyon and looking at the Grand Canyon with my legs dangling over the edge thinking, look at the magnificence of what God created. And, uh, and the way, you know, the river carved out from God's creation that magnificent canyon. Or one time I was up on the Skyline Drive, and we stopped at, a, at an overlook, and I was looking out towards Tennessee, and, the, and it was just like these patchworks of farms, you know, in all different colors laid out, and it just was so beautiful that I said, who could possibly be here and not believe that there was a God? Um, so God reveals himself in all kinds of ways, and that's what we call epiphany. But his ultimate revelation was clearly in Jesus Christ, and we'll get there. Um, we are now in, in our church of the resurrection. Sometimes we do teaching series, and we move away from what's called the common lectionary. Common lectionary means that if you go to the back of that prayer book in front of you, you would find at the back of the prayer book a list of every scripture for every Sunday uh, of the year. Eucharistic Sundays are, are in A, B, and C years, and you would find the Sundays assigned for today. And we're using the scriptures that are assigned for today. You would also find another set of scriptures assigned for the daily office. There's, there's scriptures in the back there that are, that are assigned to be used for every day of the year. And the daily office is in a two-year cycle. So literally, if you followed the lectionary daily in your prayer or weekly in uh, our Eucharistic services, you cover a f kind of a fullness of Scripture during the year. So this day is uh, the readings are assigned for the season of Epiphany, and it's for this particular Sunday in relationship to Epiphany, second Sunday of Epiphany. And, uh, and my question is, why these readings? And, I, and I, what I mean by that is, the, you know, the people that designed the common lectionary don't just sit down and say, well, why don't we throw this one in here, or, and this one for the epistle, and this one for the Old Testament, without thinking about why they're putting them together. I mean, they, 
they put the readings together for a reason. So why did they put these readings together? And what does it mean that they took, put these readings together? And obviously, um, one of them was the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And, you know, in the Gospel of John and, and elsewhere, Jesus has actually been revealed to his disciples before this. But um, it is the first place in this um, wedding at Cana where Jesus manifests his power. Before this, he has not manifested any great spiritual power. Um, here is that miracle in the wedding of uh, Cana in Galilee. Um, and it is, you know, the, this is the first of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So, you know, I'm not saying that his the disciples weren't following him, and in some sense, they understood that, that Jesus was a special person, but here, he changes water to wine, and um, his disciples believed in him. They didn't just follow him. They believed in him. I mean, that's kind of what would happen, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, if a miracle happened... You know, if you saw a miracle right in front of you, um, I think you'd be impressed. And, uh, and so the, my question is, what constitutes a miracle? And sometimes we use that word miracle when it's um, not really what is technically a miracle. A miracle isn't something surprising or something unexplainable. Technically, a miracle is when something breaks the rules of the natural order. You know, water doesn't become wine without grapes being added in time. I mean, you know, just, you just don't take pure water and go, wine. I mean, that isn't what happens. I agree that water is in wine, but, but I've tried it all the time. You know, I open my faucet, not wine. I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. It's a miracle. And, and so when that water turned to wine, it caught their attention. Clearly, it would catch your attention. And, uh, and obviously, the miracle was done to show God's power and to have people see the power that Jesus had and to bring people to believe in him. It was to reveal another dimension to who Jesus was. Now, I think it's important to keep that in mind because it was the method that Jesus uh, chose to reveal himself first with the power of God. So, um, now I'd like to switch for a moment to the reading from 1 Corinthians, where it says, now there are a variety of gifts with the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. Now, again, um, we have to assume that they put the wedding of Cana and chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians together for a reason. So the question is, why? Why did they put the wedding of Cana, the first miracle of Jesus, and the list of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 together? And the answer is because Jesus reveals his gifts to the church so that we become the revelation of God. Jesus revealed his identity and his power in miracles and healings and other things. And then he empowers the church to reveal God to the people through the gifts of the Spirit. That we aren't given the gifts of the Spirit so that 
we can feel good or that somehow good things are done, we're given the gifts of the Spirit so that when they occur, God's power is revealed and people believe. When God's power is revealed, people believe. And it's most easily seen through supernatural gifts. In other words, some of the gifts are accentuated or um, betterment of natural powers, while others are supernatural gifts. So, for example, you take the gift of healing as compared to preaching, okay? I mean, they're both, if they're going to be properly used, are God's ordained power. But, you know, I stand at that door after doing a sermon, and they may be mistaken. People may just be trying to be nice to me. But some people come out the door, and they say, good sermon. And, you know, I think sometimes people think that when I preach, it's, a, it's my intelligence it's my ability to reason. It's my ability to organize thought. It's my ability to put together materials that comes from my natural talents that are showing up here. And so they're saying, Danny, you did a good job. You showed your intelligence today. You were quite logical in the way you organized that information. And uh, sometimes when I'm standing there because I, I say, thank you. But other times I say, God is good always. Because the truth is, in preaching, it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my skills or my talents or my abilities or my intelligence or my ability to reason and put together information. If I am using the gift of preaching then what comes out of my mouth and the way it comes out of my mouth has to do with God. But it's easily misinterpreted. Okay? And many of the gifts of the Spirit, when they're used, can be easily misinterpreted. That the glory for their use can be misplaced. But healing, you know, if you have fourth stage cancer and the doctor says there's nothing I can do for you. We've given you all the treatments there are, there aren't any more. And someone lays hands on you and asks for God to heal you and you're healed. Nobody confuses that with that person's ability. They know that God had to do it. And so it's important to recognize that many of the gifts of the Spirit reveal God, reveal God's power and God's presence and God's transformative power by their expression in the church. But don't get confused that even the other ones are routine. If we're and I don't want to go into the gifts of the Spirit. We just finished that. But we do need to recognize that we're intended to have these gifts. And I don't mean one or two. This is the reading from Mark 16. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Well, these signs will accompany you if you believe. In the name, in my name, in Jesus' name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. And I'm just focusing on healing today. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And these signs will accompany those who believe. It's all who believe. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. That doesn't mean 
that we can perfectly express that and that everyone is healed. But can you imagine what would happen if we really started laying hands on people and God healed them? And we saw the power of God expressed daily and routinely through this church and through the people in this church? Can you imagine what would happen if, if that happened over and over again? I mean, it's quite clear, isn't it? That people's lives would be better. If someone's healed, their life is very much better. Jesus would be revealed because people would know that people aren't healed by human effort except doctors. And I'm not saying that we don't use doctors because I do. And the kingdom would grow if we routinely had people healed through the laying on of hands and calling forth the name of Jesus to heal, and they were healed, we would find this church busting at the seams. It would be obvious that God's power was all over it. Now, that doesn't happen. So, and yet it did happen for 350 years until the church became the church of the government with the conversion of Constantine. The church was this scattered group of people where they all prayed for healings. And you can read the stories of the uh, healings that occurred throughout um, the early church. But something happened when the church became the church of the um, enlightened aristocracy, so to speak. At that point, even though it wasn't the age of, of the Renaissance or Enlightenment, people began to move away from the practices of using the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and they began to be relegated. Instead of being something that everybody thought they could do, you know, all believers should manifest these gifts so all people should pray for their sick friends and their sick neighbors and their sick family members. And every Sunday, we should have healing offered in church so that people can come for prayer and that Jesus can heal. Instead of that, we began to see, and I'm quoting Francis McNutt here, who was a Roman Catholic priest who married a Roman Catholic nun and left the ordained ministry, but ended up being the, probably the, among the most famous of the uh, clergy in the country, uh, in fact, in the world, uh, that with a healing ministry. And I, I read, I'm reading a new one of his books um, because Joni and I are leaving after the services today to go to Camp St. Christopher for a three-day conference on healing by the Francis McNutt Institute. So I've been rereading one of his books, and this is uh, what Francis says. He says, it came to be that instead of everyone praying for healing, it was that only saints can be expected to work miracles, and I'm no saint. Um, <laughs> I'm no saint. That's true, not in the, in the sense of, I'm not St. Paul, I'm not St. Peter, um, but there were many people that we, of whom you've never heard who have prayed for healing and healing has occurred. So, um, I'm no saint. And so others would say, I don't have the kind of faith that's needed to pray for healing. Well, it isn't your faith that matters. It's Jesus' power that matters. You just need to act in response to the Holy Spirit that he's given you, that he's placed inside of you. And then the other one, and this one doesn't come from Francis McNutt, it comes from me, and because I've heard so many people say it, it, that God has bigger things to worry about than the healing of my infirmities that God's kind of in control of the universe. He's really not going to be engaged in my life. 
And yet, in the early church, again and again, he healed people. And he healed people through his, of the laying on of hands of those who believed. So what happens if the church won't use the gifts of the Spirit? You know, last week we had baptism and we had reaffirmation of baptism. We say that you have the Holy Spirit living in you. God lives in you. Well, if we, what happens if we don't use the gifts of the Spirit that are given because God lives in us? And it means that the only way of revealing God is through our natural talents and abilities and how great are they? How great are they? You notice in that reading from 1 Corinthians, one of the things that it said there as a gift of the Spirit, it isn't even just healing, miracles. The church has people with the gift of miracles breaking the rules of natural order. I know of one situation where a person sees who has no optic nerves, where the optic nerves are dead, and they see. That breaks the natural order when you can see and your optic nerves are dead. That's never supposed to happen like that. So what would happen if we don't use the spiritual gifts? Same old stuff. Nothing particularly powerful happening. The church goes on. What happens if people won't receive the benefits of the gifts of the Spirit? You know, sometimes the the Spirit can't do it because we have a healing station and nobody stands up to ask for prayer. The people say, oh, not me. I'm not going to ask for God to heal me. I'd rather keep my disease. I like it. In the Alpha series, Nicky Gumbel says, was uh, that a guy was saying that there were using the gift of knowledge, he said there are eight people here with athlete's foot. And Nicky Gumbo was sitting in the front row next to his wife, and he says, seven people responded. And his wife, Pippa, knew he had athlete's foot, but he wouldn't get up. She's gone. <laughs> get up, get up. He said, finally, I had to get up because of my, frame, my ribs were going to be broken. And he was the eighth one. But... Uh, but he, someone who even is supposed to believe in the gift of healing, was, was saying, not me. not me. I don't want to get up there. What happens if we won't even receive the benefits of the Holy Spirit? What, if, what good would new beginnings be if no one came to receive the gifts? We could set up a grand and elaborate system by which we will meet the needs of the poor, and if the poor said, oh, I'm not going to admit I'm poor. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go there and admit that I'm poor. And we could have the best system in the world, generosity outpouring from every poor. And unless somebody's willing to receive it, it's useless. No good at all. See, the easiest way to prevent the revelation of Christ is that we refuse to practice the gifts of the Spirit, and we refuse to receive them. We do that, and it's just a collection of people gathering together to talk about a famous hero, one that we read about in the books, not one that's present and active and powerful in our midst today. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you are the God who is alive, the God who has poured his spirit into our very midst, the God who says on the mountain of his ascension that all who believe in him 
would manifest these gifts. Help us, Lord, to bring the revelation of your glory more and more present in our lives and through our lives, today and always. Amen.